Every single team from EU and NA that goes to MSI will spend the first one, two weeks of their boot camps getting absolutely destroyed. Probably the best split I've seen from Jensen, at least in recent memory, maybe in his entire career. It's a rough time to be any person related to Carmen Kof. Hello everyone and welcome back to the jungle. I'm Jenny, joined with Medic, Kabi and Broxa to talk about anything and everything League of Legends related in the LEC and the LCS. We're going to be discussing Carmine Core and their demise in the LEC, but also the playoffs. Make sure you leave a comment down below because we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. But let's start things off immediately with the LCS and the playoffs and how exactly that is going, Cubby? Because I think an upset would be a great word potentially to describe it. Yeah, you know, everyone thought that C9 was back after the 3-0 against 100 Thieves, and I might be more keen to say that C9 is back after their 0-3 against FlyQuest, as that was a bit of a beatdown wow. that we had on the Rift. Okay. Uh, on the flip side, we do have TL 3 one 100 Thieves, uh, and they have a date with C9 to see who makes MSI, which uh, honestly could be quite fun. So, yeah, I, I mean... What did you guys think about like NA right off the bat? Because I know that I was expecting C9. I had them 3-2 over FlyQuest, and then they kind of got whooped on the Rift. Yeah, I think they did. I, I think um, there was a couple of key points that worked really well for FlyQuest. Firstly, their mid-game looks really clean. I think Inspired and Busio are, are teaming up incredibly well. Um, I want to give a lot of credit as well to... Lucio, I, like he did get, he got all pro, uh, M, all pro support, right, in, in NA. And I kind of, maybe I just hadn't watched the right games from him, but I was a little surprised. I don't think support was as competitive as perhaps it sometimes is in NA. Um, I think like Vulcan underperformed and CoreJJ wasn't quite performing to the level he usually would. So I was a little surprised Busio got it, but having watched that series, you can really tell why. His synergy with Inspired is absolutely on point. And then alongside that, I, Jojo got gapped, man. <laughs> Jojo got hard gapped in the middle lane. He didn't get a single kill in all the games. Jensen didn't have a single death in all the games. And obviously, a lot of that comes from are you getting pressure from your mid jungle, uh, from your jungle support? How is the map playing around you? But even in lane, I really think that Jensen, Jensen just seemed to have Jojo's number. Um, probably the best split I've seen from Jensen, at least in recent memory, um, maybe, maybe in his entire career. I, I'm going to say in recent memory because I honestly, I don't remember Jensen's entire career off the top of my head. Um, so if you're out there and you think, oh, actually in 2017, he had this incredible split where he played NASA's mid six times. Sure. Cool. Recent memory though, Jensen absolutely on top form. I think FlyQuest has also built a really interesting team that works so nicely together. Like... Uh, Bushu is having some experience now and you can see that experience really coming into play when him and Inspired start forming synergy. They have Jensen, who's always been a really dominant uh, laner. Um, not the, the most roam-heavy kind of guy, but he dominates lane when he want, gets resources and becomes really strong. Inspired, also pretty farm-heavy, so I think they complement each other pretty well in that sense. And then Buibo is really good at setting up team fights and finding engages and bringing some uh, aggression. And overall, I just think all these pieces balance each other out so nicely throughout the entire game and my biggest worry for them going into the c9 series was was the early game because that has been c9 strength like dominating early game and then trying to use that to snowball sometimes they would be able to sometimes the mid game kind of kind of fell apart but uh you know they just come in really really well prepared like you mentioned utilized jensen's really strong laning phase and and shut down jojo and and i think that really is the key to to beating c9 like if you can target the mid lane and if you can uh, put him down like blabo and vulcan are not gonna, not gonna be able to do anything either and then you can just spread the pressure and 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 you know destroy them because the mid mid and late game just isn't strong enough yeah i think a great example of that was actually game three because um Berserker was five and one, I think it was on the Z. Yeah. Like, he was monster fed. And then there's one bot lane play where FlyQuest, they're like three and nine down. Uh, Fudge, I think, overextends in the bot lane. They pick off Fudge, then they manage to get a couple more kills. And then as they're setting up for a Drake, Inspired sees this angle where he jumps onto the back line, Shockwave comes down, and the game just swings so well. And it's all based around like, Good vision control, being on the same page when you want to call for an engage, because Inspired's in, immediately Jensen's shockwaving, immediately Busio's following up. So I think um, even if their, their early game is a little bit lacking, and maybe when they get to MSI, they, they'll be punished more than C9 were able to punish them here. In terms of mid game, 
I honestly think FlyQuest might have the best mid game in the West right now. It's Ooh. tricky because LEC is such a fucking mess <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. So like a couple of weeks ago, I would have said G2 was up there as well, but G2 really don't don't look amazing right now. And whether that's like, oh, we're already qualified, doesn't matter. Who knows? But right now, from that series alone, I think FlyQuest mid game is the best I've seen across three games in, in the West, at least. The the thing that I like really like about this team, like I I, I appreciate you know Broxy you bringing up like you kind of like what FlyQuest has been cooking with just the team they put together. It's like for me, I mean I'm I'm the Challengers League caster, right? And Masu and Busio were the most valuable prospect uh, that like we voted on uh, for the last summer for Masu and then two summer or like two summers ago for Busio. So before he went pro with Hundred Thieves, um, and like the. Our idea behind that award is like it's like wins above replacement for baseball. So if you don't know that stat, it's like we're uh, trying to project like, you know, t- if you have two years in LCS right after you win this, like, are you going to be worth like wins is like that's the theory behind it. Like we kind of get to argue for who we think is going to win. And it's funny because like, you know, their waiting phase hasn't been great. Like they got double killed game one by Berserker, um, you know. Uh, they were behind like there was the five kills area in game three yawn and core were kind of crapping on them in that series two and then but it's funny because like i remember that's what was happening with danny and vulcan when they won with uh, jojo in 22 spring i believe or uh, 21 spring wh- whichever one that was the jojo's debut split and it's wild to think to me that like it feels like masu and busio like are somewhat emulated in the same way it's like yeah you know like we aren't the best laners but our team is so good around us it's setting us up and like we do have talent to actually cash in later in the game whether it's seeing stuff like oh, Busio had some really nice takes on Nautilus especially in game three uh and Masu has actually like put together some really nice team fights which I'm not surprised like that's why he was promoted to the FlyQuest roster in the first place um and so I think the fact that like they at least were able to build a roster that to me made a lot of sense for like how the like that core of like very talented, experienced players, even after coming off of breaks, by the way, uh, which I think is crazy. And just like kind of, you know, I love the phrase that form is temporary, but class is forever. I, I almost feel like they've really proved that this split with like how they've been able to really bolster and get that bot lane to the later stages of the game where, you know, they do step up and deliver on what, on what they're able to do. I also wouldn't be way too worried about bot lane having a. A relatively hard time in, in some of the early games because I think you know some of those laning mistakes is something that you can relatively easily fix as yep. long as everybody's on the same page and has good macro and synergy later uh, that that's generally the, the tricky part because I've been on teams in the past like uh, CLG <laughs> uh, specifically where our early games were great like we were all dominating in, in lane and we were getting leads consistently but we just couldn't find synergy we couldn't find a way to, to function as a team and it was like impossible for us to fix like even after a year we, we didn't manage to fix it but here you just you know keep an eye on your laning phases you review them you try to find out where mistakes are happening especially at the messiah like that's going to be huge for them laning against some insanely good bot lanes and learning yeah. and once you get that down everything is great because masu is coming in as, as a rookie and he's like amazing in, in terms of team fighting and positioning and the way he navigates in the later stages and if that's like your your number one weakness then i would say you're in a, in a pretty chill position yeah, it's also a much easier oh, sorry jenny it's also a much easier thing to practice right you go to yeah. msr you're on the ionian super server for solo queue and you have to lane like that's early game that entirety obviously in, in pro play is a little bit more coordinated than that but if you're dying 2v2 in lane how do you practice it where you play against some of the highest elo best server players in the world right and you just try and 2v2 lane against them and you keep you keep putting the reps in so i always i, I would always take a team that has a good at mid game and a bad early game in terms of if i was to coach a team over a team that has a bad mid game and a good early game because it's a lot harder as boxer says to teach those concepts and to teach that synergy uh, for the mid game yeah, I feel like we're dissecting a lot in terms of FlyQuest, what they're doing well, and potentially like some of their worries for them on the international stage. But I also want to talk a bit more about, about Clyde Nine, particularly because coming into this cubby, like you're you're absolutely right. Everybody, I mean, including their goldfish, was thinking that this was going to be Cloud Nine series. But for the fact to be a, a really clean, what it felt like clean three and sweep from the side of FlyQuest, what went wrong there? I, I mean, for me, like. I do feel like C9 got 
like they are a team that has names like you cannot ignore and the 100 thieves series like they did have a dominant 3-0 but for me like i watched that series like i knew that river was under the weather and like 100 thieves to cancel scrims and like i thought that some of those drafts were a bit disrespectful in terms of giving c9 multiple winning lanes and like winning jungle matchups and a couple of those games were over pretty early for me and i think c9 played them out fine but like, i remember watching that series like i don't know how much i learned about c9 as a team and then we get to this series with FlyQuest and all the same mistakes when it was a little bit more of like a closer early game or more competitive drafts emerged. And my biggest issue with the C9 team is like the game's two and three draft, they have to play out three lanes with the One. And then game one, you're playing into a Hue Senna Karma core. Um, I didn't see them take a single fight where, like, they're creating any angles. And, like, if you're not going to create any angles, like, especially with Talia in that game one, like, they had Talia Vi with Callisto. Like, I thought their comp was doable. You know, like, you, you can try and smork and, like, you know, win early and press your buttons on the same targets. Like, they're picking the wrong targets. Like, the one Vi Talia successful combo I saw was on Renekton, which, like, only got his stare axe. And then, like, later on, like, the JoJo walls were kind of, like, to join the team. And then you're front to backing against, like, way Senna Karma. Like, that's just not a winning formula in terms of how you play out map against comps like that. And I feel like we saw that really come to fruition in all three games. Like, I don't think C9 pushed FlyQuest at all in terms of, like, actually trying to, like, find a winning side lane where then you can actually create an angle and, like, try and pressure the strong cores that FlyQuest were taking. I also think C9 have a really high grub priority, which was strange to me. Because against team, like, against FlyQuest, who do like to take drakes and who have these compositions that are very good and more front to back team fights. It was very strange to me that they put themselves at a two dragon deficit to get six grubs in the early game. And sometimes like, obviously that's the decision on, well, our bot lane's not pushing at the right time. Mid can't get prior, right? So we can't get into the, the river effectively, but you can overload to make sure you're not giving up the first two drakes in those sorts of situations. So in game one and two, especially I found C9 would be coming to a third Drake fight knowing that they needed to win it, otherwise the enemy team's at sole point, and they'd make misplays because they were kind of putting themselves uh, on a knife set. It was like, well, we have to use the Weaver's Wall here to try and separate the team, but then it gets used slightly early, and Inspired still manages to be in the pit, so then he kicks away uh, Blabo and steals the Drake, and it, it just felt like they put themselves on a bit of a clock by prioritizing topside, at least in terms of neutral objectives. Meaning that FlyQuest were always able to get into a position where it's like, well, we've got the first two dragons. If we're behind after that, we can just sit back and, and wait for our next item. We can just sit back and scale a little bit more, right? Um, so I think some of the, the early game prioritization decisions seems a little bit off to me. And as I said, like, I, I don't know exactly what C9 are calling for. They might just be calling, hey, our bot can't get prior in this situation. We have to give. Um, but... I'm, if you're playing Callisto and Ardo, I feel like you should be able to overload bot to get prio into a Senna Karma, right? Even if so, they can hold the wave, you should be yeah. able to push them out. I think specifically with that game, with First Drake, I actually think Inspired saved the game, because after his bot lane got double killed, he snuck in and took the Drake before they could like reset yeah. and take it. So that was really big, but I, I agree with you. I, and yeah, sometimes the other team yeah. just outplays you, right? 100%. Yeah. But I think it, it, it was consistent enough that I would have liked C9 just to put a little bit more prio, especially since your bot lane was probably your best performing lane. Right? Berserker and uh, Vulcan were getting 2v2 kills. They were winning out bot side. So at that point, you have to translate that into other advantages, and one of those advantages is taking drakes. Think, you mentioned as well, is... hmm? You want to go first? No, no Bass, come on, talk. Go ahead. Rock, Get us. Do it. I, I think the game is interesting now that Void Growth has been added because for like 10 years the game was so straightforward in terms of how you would play jungle and the only objectives to play for was dragon and now it seems like a lot of players and, and, and teams are very unsure of what to actually do. It's the same when I play solo queue, like some junglers are on dragon, like on point, sitting there at 5 minutes uh, like we, we used to do in, in the past and, and they do it immediately and others act like it don't exist because they prioritize the Void Growths over it and I think eventually people are going to realize that dragons are just objectively better like there's not even a discussion um it, it it's just better overall and um you know eventually uh, i i think when people get that void growth it's just like another camp really um 
those priorities are going to change and we're going to start seeing a lot more early fights around the dragon and then they in the EU because you simply can't afford giving up too many of them because like you said if you give like the first two dragons for free all of a sudden the enemy team is really close to soul point and you're forced to take uh, well most likely will be taking a lot of really bad fights to, to try to prevent them from from getting to that yeah, I think kind of like going back onto this onto the macro topic, but also from like what Cubby said earlier in terms of it didn't feel like Cloud Nine has truly pushed FlyQuest particularly. How would that translate more into the international stage? Because you said it already yourself, Medic. When we're looking at the players that they're going to be going up against, like the laning phase is going to be really difficult. But we also know how great these other regions are when it comes to their macro gameplay and with the changes in objectives and the changes in the map and everything. That's a lot to take into consideration here. I think what you need to realize is that every single team from EU and NA that goes to MSI will spend the first one, two weeks of their boot camps getting absolutely destroyed. And Fine. I'm talking from experience. I don't think I've ever been, been at an international event where we didn't get completely murdered uh, at the very beginning. And that's really the beauty of it, because generally for the leaks, like for the last seven, eight years, probably longer, like LCK and LPL just has been on a higher level than we have. But then it really comes down to how quickly you can rebuild and catch up during your boot camp and whether you can can take the constant bullying and the constant losses and learn from it or if your team completely falls apart. And we've seen both in, in the past. But like for me, it's going to be hard to predict which teams going into MSI that will have the highest chance of performing because I think the boot camp is just everything. Like you need to take in all you can when it comes to laning phase and macro and dragon control and team fighting and vision control and uh, base timings like it's just like you're you're almost relearning relearning the game in a sense and that's gonna be be the case for literally every team going into it i i mean i'll pop off maddox point about i'd prefer to be the team that has the better mid to late game and I mean, as you know, the EU fans here, I, I'm not surprised because like that was the beauty of G2 F and Fnatic when they were really strong coming out of EU, right? Like G2's early games, like they would oftentimes be down gold early on to you know some of the LCK teams, and they just had these magical mid games, right? They would make these calls that like everyone else didn't really see, but all of a sudden, like you know, Mickey would appear somewhere, and it would be a winning play. Like I think that Mickey was really responsible for like playing through mid and mid prior. Like I remember. He was like one of the first supports outside the East to really leech XP off Midwave to get six before Herald fight. Like that was huge, right? Um, and like I look at this C9 team, like you can't fix those mid game issues if you go international and you're gonna start like actually being hands checked, which is what C9's best at. Like I I don't know what happens to this team. Like they don't have an identity outside of like winning early game, you know. I think there's an argument that uh, for the C9 point specifically, maybe them getting fucked in early game wakes them up. You know, I'm not saying that they're not trying hard to improve, but like if, if yeah. you're like, oh, it's fine, guys, we can win early and then we just win by being like 5k gold ahead. Maybe when you start being 5k gold behind in the early game, you realize, oh, actually, we need to f start working out ways to get back in games. Right. And maybe that helps them. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that's dependent on whether C9 go to MSI because only FlyQuest are locked. Right. Um, yep. I will say, I think one of the major issues uh, compared to yesteryear where G2, you know, had their inventive picks and they'd find like pockets of vision played really yep. well around it when Mickey was like Mickey was doing well, when Fnatic did it well as well. Um, at the moment, a lot of games are decided via team fights. You can't just like pick someone in a side lane, then take an objective, then win the game. There are some games like that, but a lot of it is a we set up for a dragon, we'll team fight around the dragon. OK, who wins the team fight? Chinese LCK teams are pretty fucking good at team fights. Like they're, they're the best team fighters in the world. And the issue becomes like, do, you can't just mimic them to beat them. Unless our teams, like everyone levels up team fighting in the LCS and LEC, and we can actually get to a level where we can compete with them on a pure 5v5. I think you have to do what like teams that have won in the past have done. Get a pike, find a Nautilus mid, find something weird that you can learn that isn't being isn't just replicating the LCK or LPL because I think if I look at some of the team like 
in the LPL, you have Billy Billy, you have JDG, you have Top Esports. Like, their team fighting is pretty insane. Gen G, T1. Like, I don't want to go into an even mid game against those teams, no matter who I am from Europe. Obviously, I'm not the players, and they probably have a lot of confidence in themselves that they can take those wins, and you have to to be able to compete on an international level. But from an analytical point of view, any of any of the teams of FlyQuest, C9, uh, TL, Fnatic, G2, Vitality, I, I don't take any of them at an even mid game against any of the top four teams in LPL, or probably three or four teams in the LCK. I do think having a, a clear style and identity definitely is is a very important important point because like you said that is a big part of why we and Fnatic did so well in 2018 and G2 yeah. in, in 2019 uh, because the practice you get throughout the year just isn't the same as, as they get over, over in the east so you kind of have to start cooking and come up with something slightly different um, that, that you can then beat them with and I don't think any of that is, is entirely impossible but I, I do think the West often falls into this trap of of feeling like we're behind because, well, we usually are, at, at least at the, the start and, and middle of the year. And then even even on teams, like a lot of players and coaches from, let's say, a drafting point of view, just try to copy everything they do over there. But it's pretty difficult to copy some somebody's homework and just try to apply it to yourself when there's talk about different players and strengths and weaknesses and uh, identity and, and goals and all that and i think eventually uh you know more teams are going to just stick to whatever they think works for them push that strategy and then you know just go hard or go home and, and, and hope for the best. And I do think a team like FlyQuest is starting to, to find their, their footing in terms of how they want to play the game. And sure, like it, it's it's pretty traditional overall, but at least they all know their exact role within that style, which is a really great step in the right direction. I actually think uh, FPX is a great example of beating Chinese teams with a, a strategy Whoa. that isn't just we out team fight you. They yeah, just say, yeah. okay, hey, Mil Milky Way exists. He is the next, like, he's the prodigal son of journey, uh, junglers. Like, he is the next great thing. You will hear the name Milky Way probably every year for the next five years, assuming nothing crazy happens, right? This guy is the jungler. He's in his rookie split, <laughs> and <laughs> all they do is they say, okay, Milky Way, here is a carry. Win us the game. And, like, the rest of FPX are good players, like, no doubt about it. But they're not, like, JDG levels. They're not BLG levels. But Milky Way just, like, says, okay, cool. Get in my backpack. We're going to go win the game. And it is absolutely absurd to watch. He does crazy things. And obviously, you can't just, like, you can't just make another Caps. You can't just make another Milky Way. But I really like the idea of just saying to a player, go and be you, and we'll work out how the team works around that. Right? I really like that idea. It's funny it's FPX too, because FPX also had a very clear style at Worlds 2019. Yeah, Doinby, right? That yeah, won them the entire tournament. Like, it was... I hated playing against them. It was brutal, because <laughs> Do and B would always play a supportive champion like Nautilus mm -hmm. or Malphite, and then the synergy between the jungle supports, Tien and Crisp, I believe it was, and Do and B was so good that literally nobody could play the game. Like, it felt like no matter what you did, like, they were constantly mid, they were constantly in jungle, they constantly had control of bot lane, and, and both us and Fnatic and G2 got completely murdered by them. Every team that went up against them got murdered by them because the synergy was just on a whole other level, and we felt like we had a pretty good understanding of, of how to play around each other, but, but sometimes, you know, when somebody really commits to a certain style, and they're so further ahead of everybody else like it just takes so long to come up with with the counter and the answers and then you get destroyed and it literally won them the tournament like they were just so good at it i mean finding the identity obviously my question here then will be how exactly would a team go around to do that would it be taking a lot more time to just focus on finding it like that being the main focus of scrims being the main focus of any analysis because when we're looking at the lcs they have a huge break ahead of msi and if time is what they need potentially this could be a great thing for them we can look at it from the perspective of oh they're out for a long time they're not going to be competing competitively they're just going to be scrimming but is that maybe what they need 
to be able to find out how they want to approach the international stage more solidly, so to say. I think it's a willingness to let players be players as well, right? I, 100 Thieves is a good example of it in LCS where, like, Quid, no one would have kept Quid. <laughs> Like, he did not really have a good 2023. No. Sniper is a player that you can start to mold into a more traditional top lane player, but they don't tend to put him on tanks because he's not a tank player. They're just like, okay, Sniper, here's Aatrox, here's the Relectin, do what you can, right? Um, so I, I think you don't have to say we are going to alter everyone's play patterns just for this one player, similar to FPX, but you can say, instead of making you play a tank top because we think it fits our team comp, we're going to accept that we don't play tank tops that often. Every now and again, maybe we will. But for now, you're a carry top laner and we're going to work out a way to make carry top laners working our draft most of the time. I mean, just just think back of, of like Wanda when G2 were the best. Like, it, it was like completely <laughs> unplayable for a lot of the Eastern top laners because they're so used to playing traditional top lane matchups. And then you have this crazy boy with locks and completely random champs just like pike and just starts roaming and, and, and making plays and I think sometimes bringing that creative and, and untraditional approach obviously if it's if it's the right one then taking those risks can can really really pay off big time but I, I, I also think it just comes down to just not being afraid of trying to find your own way and doing your own thing rather than um, just trying to copy what, what they do over in the east because that's that's a scary trap to fall into. Like just figure out what what every player is best at and 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 set them up for success. Like let's say for me, when I came into Fnatic in the beginning, I was like a really gank heavy jungler, and something that I had a lot of success with in solo queue was playing Elise and buying Moby boots and just running around like a literal maniac ganking everybody. I think I was the only player who played Moby boots Elise in in, in pro player at least in the LEC, but. The coach was like, hey, I mean, it's working. Nobody has ever been, been ganked this much before. They clearly don't know how to respond to it. So so go for it. And then, you know, eventually if the meta changes, we can we can adjust. So, so just giving players freedom can, can definitely pay off at times. I, it's funny because, like, uh, it's kind of the thing I'm scared of with, like, C9 in terms of, like, finding an identity. I don't know what their identity is. Like, I, I mean, yeah, it's like, all right, we can win early games, right? But, like, what is it outside of that? And that's not good enough. Like, I, I don't think we've ever sent, like, the super dominant early game team from the West International. And, like, I, I can't remember a, a version of that team that's done well, you know? Uh, and, and I think, like, if I'm C9, like, it's too late. And for me, that's why I'm, like, actually pretty heavily favoring TL going into this weekend. Because I, I love what Jensen said in his post-game interview. Uh, he's like... I don't know if I can say C9 wins after they just played against us like that, you know, pretty much. And I agree. Like, I, I don't know. I, I think TL is actually playing quite well off each other. Uh, and I, I think it's going to be a really interesting series because I think C9 is going to get upset, which a lot of people view it as upsets given the names. But based on what I've seen on the tape, TL is actually like they have somewhat of an identity. They actually play well together. Like APA is... I think the Rel pick and like the Recon picks have been really big for them and like synergizing off of APA playing stuff like Ziggs Asol where you do kind of want to like scale in Wombo. And I think TL's actually been really successful at like finding ways to make this work. Are you then assuming potentially it's going to be TL Fly who yes. are grabbing up those two MSI spots? How yeah. do you think as the teams that they are and what they've been doing so far over the LCS split, how is that one like close to one month i think between lcs finishing and msi starting that's a lot of time realistically like in a perfect world how would you expect them to approach that cubby take a break first that's important i i, I actually like no I, yeah <laughs> no we i actually like the best part about that uh like that one month break is the fact that you can actually have players take a small break i i think that before you go into a boot camp like I mean, I appreciate, like, you know, Brox to talk about the importance of a boot camp, like, boot camp, like, he's been through it. That gets a lot easier if you aren't boot camping three days after you just, like, won or lost a final, you know? Like, if you want to be ready to boot camp like that, I think it is really important to take a couple days or, like, a week for your team to be like, okay, you're about to go, like, through a really intense, like, you know, uh, tournament where you are going to have to prep and catch up. And it's going to be a lot of work from everyone. And I think that having a couple bonus days to actually take yourself 
is really important before you're going to like go actually approach that. Uh, and then from there, I mean, I, it's just do your best. It's, it's figure out like what works for you. And I, I appreciate how, you know, both Brox and Matic are kind of like, you do have to find something that works for you and is a little bit unique. Cause I think that something that's powerful in league is always knowledge gap, right? Like Doin B, no one knows how to play Nautilus mid better than Doin B. Like Brox is playing Moby Boots Elise. Like no one just played that except for him. He's going to know so many more scenarios. And I think that it is really important to like see where you can kind of find um, like those niches for yourself and like a few weeks leading up to a tournament, like what can work for you and like what you can do to break the meta. I think that's really big. Um, I mean, I, I think another example of that could be Blabber's Olaf in the past. Like, yeah. There's been so many years where, you know, Blabber would just slam Olaf and completely steamroll everybody and nobody has been able to, to play it as, as good as him, right? Yeah. But I, I, I think when it comes to the break, a lot of people may be worried that there's a one month break because it's it's a long time between the end of the, the split and, and the tournament. But I honestly think it's a positive thing because like we we talked about earlier, I think those boot camps going into international tournaments are pretty much everything and they're gonna learn so much more during that boot camp than they would if the you know, split <laughs> lasted another one, two weeks. So having you know a break for like four or five days or whatever uh to just recharge the batteries and, and mentally prepare for what's to come traveling to to korea or, or china um wherever they want to boot camp and just getting started and playing the eastern teams as soon as possible i, I think it's going to be great uh going going into the tournament because yeah, that's just the straight up where they're going to learn the most so just gonna get there as soon as possible and make the most of it does that potentially put LEC maybe a little bit at a disadvantage? Because we're only starting playoffs this week, whereas when we're looking at LCS, when we're starting, they're going to be donezo. Yeah, I think we finish uh, the 14th, right? And I Yeah, it's I, pretty late. Wait, it's have been... the official MSI dates been announced before I accidentally leak? Leaks! <laughs> MSI dates 2024. It just uh, it says it starts on the 1st of May and ends on the 19th of May on Google. Okay, using those dates, whether mm -hmm. or not they are accurate. Mm -hmm. Wink, wink, um, or... I'm, uh, I'm not <laughs> even going to wink because I can't remember the dates I've been told. So we're just going <laughs> to just gonna use those dates. I, like You still have two and a half weeks. Yeah. You could, uh, I mean, yeah, it's not as much. Probably take three days off and then fly out on like the 18th. You still have a two-week boot camp. I think, oh, like, obviously... The longer is better, but there's always the issue of like how much of a gap do you want to leave? Um, and obviously with the two splits before MSI that uh, the LEC has, to get everything else in, a, in before now, we would have had to either start even earlier or remove some of the breaks between splits. I can't... Do we have three weeks between splits? Yeah, maybe take that down to two weeks mm -hmm. or something. Um, I don't think it's a massive issue, uh, only having two and a half weeks. I think it's... Uh, yeah, I th I prefer it to having a month, but I'm not a pro player. What so. what patch are playoffs? Fourteen six for at least. See, that's not that actually is kind of nice because like at least you're prepping a patch that had a lot of changes and is much closer to like what MSI will look like. So that we that's assume. yeah yeah that's I mean that is nice. Is I assume MSI will be fourteen eight. Seven or eight. There's seven. Sure. No, well seven comes out now and then eight will come out on like. The end of LEC playoffs, right? That so makes sense, yeah. I assume it would be 14 8. I do, it is always an interesting idea where I know often the balance team has talked about we, we want to have patches be less big before international competition because you don't want to change things too much. But like football never gets patched, right? Uh, apart from, you know, maybe you introduce VAR, uh, soccer for you, Cubby. Sorry, American yeah. football, I don't know. You probably change your rules on like concussion protocols. And I was about to say, I can talk about rule yeah. changes they made this week. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but like, we, we've had so many times in the past where there's been a massive patch before Worlds and it totally changes the meta or a massive discovery before an international tournament. I wonder how, uh, maybe Broxy, you can elucidate on this a little bit. Like, do you ever go into an international event and think, we're actually really not suited for how the meta's changed going into this event, how things have been set up with the, with the patch changes? Well, I, I think it's, it depends from, from year to year. Like the most crazy one I can remember, I wasn't even part of, but that's, 
I think it was 15 or something. Yeah, juggernaut. Juggernaut changes. <laughs> Gangplank and, like, and Mordecai's a band every game. Yeah, yeah. That, that was like ridiculous, right? Where champions just randomly were so OP that if they were ever played, they would just stomp everybody and you almost couldn't lose. Um, I remember 2017. That's probably the most awkward one I can remember because right around the time Worlds began, there was a big patch that included an Evelyn rework. And oh, yes. I just had to permaban Evelyn every single game in solo queue because seeing that champion would literally be a waste of my time because <laughs> if they locked it in and pro play, it would be the old version, right? Uh, but the thing is, I think most pros and, and teams, um, they obviously scrim a lot generally, but especially during international events, you usually put in some extra blocks. And then... A lot of the main learnings that you find are going to come from the scrims and playing with your team. And solo queue is mostly to, to practice like individual champions and to make sure you're on top of your game mechanically and all that. Sure, you can also test some some, some different things. Like for a jungler, you can test certain paths or whatever. But I don't think it's, it's that big of a deal uh, generally. Um, I also want to point out that when it comes to, to taking breaks and burnout and whatnot... I would be surprised if any player came out and said they were experiencing burnout right now, uh, right at the start of the year, because th the teams and players that didn't go to Worlds must have had like four, five months break, if not even longer, uh, before starting things off and like sometime in the December or January. The players that did go to Worlds had at least a month, if not two months off before starting uh, practice. And, and now, like, for them, it probably feels like they, they just began. So, sure, for LEC, it's like a shorter time going into MSI. But even if they only take one day off or just fly over um, to the other side of the globe right away, I don't necessarily think it's a big deal. Because it's mostly, like, the teams that always make it to to like the finals that go to both msi and worlds and that are part of everything like then by the end of the year you can really really feel it like it's it's a tough time uh for for many reasons and it's one of the reasons uh not to come up with excuses but that we really sucked in the 2018 world final on Fnatic because that week of practice leading up to the final we were just all so tired and burned out because we were in korea for around one and a half months i think i don't think i had a single day off like we just had no downtime constant league of legends constant practice constant pressure and, and and stress and all that and if you're in that environment for too long without a break that's really tough but you know now at the start of the year i'm sure they're gonna handle it I like that you brought up scrims particularly as well, because I mean, you're you're talking about scrims being that biggest learning opportunity for teams, for players, the biggest pressure as well that you have, uh, obviously outside of playing those officials. So one of the questions that we had of some uh, angle, I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing that correctly, angle Raziel 100 and says, why don't teams stream their scrims? The players will have more pressure, the teams will earn more money and fans will see more. I know you could argue that you will show everyone your plans, but at the end of the day, it only matters how well you play, not a super secret tactic. I think it kind of goes against everything that we've already discussed because we were talking about find something that's your identity, keep that knowledge to yourself and play it. But I would like, I think I'll start off with you, Medic. I kind of want to hear your perspective more from like an analytical point of view. Like, why I wouldn't he, they? Well, I, I, I mean, I think there's a few different issues. Firstly, as you said, is revealing tactics, right? Like if you want to do a certain invade at some point uh early game or if you want to practice your level ones right every team that you face now sees what your level one strategies are and it becomes a lot harder to to win those games and sometimes you'll have prep something against a specific team and you want to try it out against your scrim partner for that week right so you know that target is passed in a certain way so you're making sure you set up your vision control in a certain position on the map right um secondly I don't think all scrims are lovey-dovey happy times within the teams. I think sometimes perhaps there might be some frustration between the players. And that's okay. That's acceptable. It'll be wow. dealt with internally. Time. How if, controversial say, of you. For example, right? I'm on a team with Broxer and I tell him, Broxer, you're a fucking moron in the middle of a game. <laughs> Maybe that gets blown up out of proportion because we're streaming our scrims and people see it. 
it really it, i think it changes the practice dynamic a lot and obviously like it does put more weight on the on the players so perhaps you can say it increases the quality of practice but i also think it means you can only practice the mundane stuff that everyone already knows and um it's likely to put a lot more pressure on the interpersonal relationships between the team mm -hmm. team members I, I think the only real upside to actually making it public would be that players would most likely take it more seriously teams as well because certain teams are just known for like always giving up and surrendering like 10 minutes into a game it's happened probably over 100 times during my career uh, over a five-year period that i saw people like literally um they would go for like a level one play or they would go for like a cheese dive level three and they would fail they pause the game and they refuse to play until we remake and move on like some <laughs> of the things that happen are really unprofessional it's almost full solo queue style right so some of that I'm sure would be would be a lot a lot greater if it was public but I think when it comes to not giving away too many of your strategies and what you practice that's a really really big part because that's something that's so incredibly important uh, in league with so many champions and, and strategies available to us and in 2019 20 21 um, not as much anymore because there's not as many academy teams around unfortunately but back then it became really popular to often do scrims with your academy teams either like do full blocks or just have some extra scrims in the evening or scrim them for like a warm-up i've tried a bit of everything really and the reason was simply that that you can practice very specific strategies in place that you can then use in official games to, to get an advantage um, you can try specific matchups you can try specific jungle paths and when you when you're about to go up against a, a game like let's say for me if i know i'm playing against a, a certain jungle at worlds i'm gonna study all their paths and try to find out how i can get a big advantage going into that game and i think having access to so much foot footage is like one thing if everyone has the opportunity but imagine when we go into worlds and all the eastern teams can watch every single scrim we've played throughout the entire year like unless their scrims are public too then it's certainly a uh, hundred percent doomed for the west every year yes, i, I, I don't get like that you brought up oh go ahead i i i just don't get the stake i i i like everyone's like oh like what if we had scrim stream i'm telling you i i get to watch scrims no one wants to watch that shit like it, i mean it's fun <laughs> yeah. but like just go play some solo queue or like spectate what's going on there i mean things get bloody like I, I mean, I think it's cool, like, already, I mean, Champs Q was doable, like, I wish your players would play more Champs Q, that was a fun Q, I liked watching them play solo Q, it was, like, that was a good time, but no one wants to watch Grims, I, like, I, I don't get it, and also, like, all the cool stuff that you guys are talking about with, like, oh, like, what if you want to prep this, like, the charm of that gets taken away, and for me, that charm is, like, a really fun part about actually watching best of ones and best of threes and best of fives, yeah. so. Also, like, realistically, when we're looking at teams and their scrims, who is actually going to be watching a team scrim for like, what, 10 hours a day, every single day, and then watch their LEC games or yeah. LCS games or whatever on the weekend? And especially with yeah. Brox, I'm mentioning things of like teams sometimes just like FFing 10 minutes in or like pausing the game when it's not necessarily the way that they wanted a certain play to come out. Would you really sit there as a viewer and watch it? Like, what about studying? What about your job? Okay, about, no, you can't. You can't tell them to touch take, grass. We're not no, allowed to do that. What about taking a shower? You know, like there's <laughs> there's a lot of different elements. You what about doing your laundry? Yeah, That's you can why. bring the laptop. Around. Wash the dry you, bring, you would bring a laptop to a park to watch a team scrim just yeah. for them to I, FF like I, ten minutes into the game. Do why the would you do that? I think there is an argument for developing fandom. Like I understand where you're coming from, Ginny. I don't think like everyone will watch it, but like if you had a three hour block each week where you're like, we're going to stream these scrims and maybe you get another team to agree to it. Maybe you get your academy team. Maybe even you get like a set of influencer players, right? And it's it's not the most serious stuff in but the world. But it's content, not scrims. Yeah, but it's content. And But like you could, you could say to your team, hey, I want you to take these games a bit more seriously, right? And maybe it's a good brand building exercise. Some of the players, maybe you release some of the voice comms from it. They get their name out there a little bit more. I don't think you can stream every scrim, but I'm sure you could have like, Maybe G2 and Fnatic once a split will be like, hey guys, this is our three hour window where we're going to do this and then everyone's going to come to our channels and they're going to like and subscribe. 
to whatever oh. they're listening to at the moment, right? Yeah. No. Um, but I think that yeah, I can see that, and I do think with a lot of our players not streaming as much now, it is a it's, it feels like an easier mm-hmm. small chunk of brand building opportunity. I just don't think you can stream all your scrims. Yeah, I mean, I get that in terms of like having like, but then again, you're talking about G2 and Fnatic coming out and like streaming, streaming their scrims and it's a three hour window. People are going to know that's when they're going to be live. But people are also going to know that it's not really a great replication of the true environment of what a scrim would be like. Sure. Also, what would you show? Would It probably might just be like solo queue between the two teams, which is great. Don't get me wrong. I would sign up for that kind of content. But I think I mean, you, you would 100% be able to get like an influencer to cast it. Oh, absolutely! Like, if they came to me and they're like, "Hey, I want you, I want you to cast this," I would 100 percent be like, "Yeah, sure." You know, yeah. I'll come along. It's good brand I mean, building for me as well. Like, I think pe- I think that idea is more fun, and yeah. would likely get more viewers. But I think that what? just like, kind of takes away from the original question of like them streaming streaming all their the scripts because sure. this is like, I mean, I like this content idea. I think that's great. But if we're staying within the realm of them actually like streaming their scrims, um, uh, like yeah, I I think we collectively yeah. agree on the fact that that's not necessarily something a team would want to do. Mm-hmm. No. I mean, FlyQuest did a show match between their challengers team in the break, and yeah. it was a blast. Like, uh, yeah. Also, shout out to them. I get Obroxo was talking about scrimming academy teams. Uh, they are, like, the best team that we have in challengers, and, like, they were doing in-houses uh, yesterday because Surti's the top laner for that team. That Blippo said's better than half the top laners in LCS, and I agree. Spoiled it on his Twitter. So, <laughs> I, I, there is value in terms of like having in houses like that still, but um, that was for entertainment purposes. And I, you know, they did ask me, and I, I did say yes. It was very fun. So medics, right? You know, it could be some fun stuff. Humble flex. Oh, I mean, it it was it was a fun event. Like it was for fun. It was for charity. So yeah. I I also think when it comes to content, I mean, there's so many things the teams could do if they wanted to do engaging stuff for the fans. I mean, you could literally do a scrim block between Fnatic and C9. Like, who cares? The ping is going to be high. Oh, yeah. Like, everybody's playing on even terms. Like, there's so many missed opportunities when it comes to that. Like, I don't even know why EU and NA teams are not just doing content, just playing each other once in a while. I know when I was part of All Stars in 2019, uh, no, 2020, uh, alongside uh, most of my, my TL teammates representing NA, I was doing it from Europe, and a lot of the matches, we had like 200 ping. It was like, <laughs> it wasn't particularly great, but that was like an actual official event. So it is doable. There are opportunities, and I'm sure you can you can find timings and ways to make it really, really cool for, for both the players and, and people watching. But I also think that's one of the downsides of the way that League has moved over the years, that it started with content creation and streaming being like, the integral part all of it being about in- entertainment and now a lot of that uh, has been diminished in order to increase the chances of perform performing internationally and doing well the problem is just that we're still not performing internationally so maybe we have to start finding more of a, a balance you know i will say i i do remember uh there being a rule for a while that a full lec roster couldn't play a show match Oh, and I, good like, point, I, actually. Yeah, so I, uh, there is a possibility this content idea would never get made anyway because True. I know for a while that rule has been in place. I think if the higher-ups in the LEC know what's good for them, they would let these things happen. But I also, maybe the teams just don't ask for it because they think that the rule is still there. Maybe the rule is still there in their contracts. I haven't seen an official team yeah, contract. You're but, right. Yeah, it It is. Because uh, FlyQuest, they couldn't bring in any other LCS teams to that event, they had to make their challenges teams. Like, why are you Gosh. shooting yourself in the foot? I'll see us off make for two like, too, I mean, by the you way. Could, yeah, you can, like, you can uh, put, like, uh, uh, put walls up around it and say, okay, you can only do it in these certain situations and you have to get our permission. Cool. But, like, uh, it's just so many times when I think Riot's shooting themselves in the foot. Like, Ludwig wanted to do that tournament and couldn't yep. get a bunch of pro players for it. Like, it, why? <laughs> It annoys me no end. I'm sorry. It actually didn't even cross my mind that there's all these regulations and rules. Because it, uh, yeah, it wasn't it Ludwig. It was really Mr. Beast, sense. wasn't it? Was it Mr. Beast who wanted to do this one? Or was it Ludwig? I mean, I Ebi has been trying to. Ebi has been in, trying for ages. Well. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I'm just remembering all the moments where there was opportunities and it, it didn't happen. But yeah, uh, yeah. I, I guess bad, getting man. some of those permissions would be step one. I just yeah. 
I think that also leads us quite nicely into another question that we had asked, and this is again in regards to scrims, particularly from uh, Eight Rundorf ninety one. Uh, should players get fined if they don't show professionalism in scrims, etc.? Traditional sports players get fined if they don't live up to certain expectations or code of conduct. You're mentioning particularly Broxa earlier, giving us a couple of examples of how like scrims were not taken too seriously or sometimes aren't. I also like a lot of players that we have interviewed go like, yeah, we just need to take scrims more seriously. So it's being said, and it's something that needs to, that everybody recognizes to an extent needs to be done. But necessarily, would a fine fix that? Well, I think if you're having this kind of problem, it's easy to, to scapegoat and blame the players, but it's not mm -hmm. only on them. Because if the players are able to not take scrims seriously, then there's a problem with the coaching staff and there's a problem with the management that sees, oversees the coaching staff and there's a problem with the people that hired the managers. Because then literally it's no, nobody's doing their job, right? Like everybody in, in that entire chain is supposed to take it seriously and have a really good structure and be disciplined and make sure that they're setting each other up for success. And I think that's that's what we, we sometimes forget about, that on these teams, there's not only the five players. I mean, sure, don't get me wrong. Like, it's it's not good enough if, if anyone is not tryharding for their life. But there's like 10, 15, 20 people like closely involved with, with the teams and in most organizations that are, are doing their best to get the most out of them. And, and I think just creating these atmospheres is, is one of the big challenges. It's something that G2 has been really good at uh, last year um, and this year where, um, you know, they are actually starting to, to publicly um, announce their scrim win rates and showcase how many teams are cancelling versus them to try to force them to make a change. Um, they're setting clear expectations for the players. Um, they're even... Well, I'm going to say force because few teams do this, but force them to exercise and do like uh, consistent sessions with their the mental coach and all that. And I do think, you know, the more you focus on all these outside factors and making sure that all these young guys come into work with the right mindset is really, really important. But you can't find a player for not showing professionalism because if they don't show professionally, professionalism consistently, then there's a bigger problem than just the players themselves. Yeah. But can, can't you find them? Like, it, I, I think I agree with you if, if you find them and then they keep doing it, it's like, well, obviously there's a, an underlying issue here that isn't being solved. But if a, like, a great example is recently VTO just ran it down in, in a game before the LEC happened, right? He, he literally... His jungler takes away his cannon. He then decides to run down mid and, and flash into the enemy team. Why can't you find someone for that? That's so unprofessional. I don't think... I mean, it depends on the way you look at it. I think, sure, you can give somebody fines and threats. But I think usually if somebody is being really unprofessional or acting out in a certain way, there's bigger problems than that. I mean, it's the same if you're playing solo queue and you have... A player on your team that acts like a literal maniac and wishes everybody really really bad things and loses intentionally like this person is just not in the right mindset for whatever reason and there's something more serious going on in their head and i think that's something that needs to be taken into account as well like i know um, right when i joined Fnatic, there was a lot of drama surrounding surrounding caps uh, because he was known as at the time a little bit of a bad boy in, in solo queue I can't remember him typing a single word the last seven years in, in a game, but um, because he had a hard time uh, dealing with the with the frustrations. But instead of you know calling him out and finding finding him and making his life more difficult, everybody in the organization just you know surrounded him and protected him and 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 helped him. And I think in a lot of cases, just showing that kind of support and, and finding solutions from 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 that perspective can actually give you something much bigger in 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 the long run i mean don't get me wrong like a lot of uh pro players in in europe do run it down in solo queue they are extremely toxic they they do lose intentionally and it shouldn't shouldn't be allowed it shouldn't happen because they're supposed to be setting a good example and they're not uh but but yeah that's generally my perspective on it i, I mean like the way this question is phrased too like i'm not sure if it's like you know, I, I think the VTO example is, like, decent, because that's a 
case where the league could step in and be like, hey, like this is unacceptable, right? And the league hands out punishments, but other stuff, like if it's just internally, like you have to handle that internally. And so like what Brox is talking about with like you making sure that you're equipped to do that's fine. Uh, and personally, you know, I, I will say uh, I never worked at the you know, professional level, but I did coach my, my collegiate team. And man, I loved making those kids run laps, man. You show up, wait to practice, lap around the library, baby. And you know what? I, that, that's what worked for us. I mean, sometimes it's just simple as that. Yeah, I agree. I think um, yeah. I, I, I think it is important to distinguish because like, I, I must have misinterpreted the question. I had it as like, can they be fined rather than I missed out the in-scrims bit, right? So I very much agree with you, Broxer. The internal issue should be dealt with internally and with you, Cubby. Um, I think how the team decides to enact internally is their decision, right? And obviously some teams may look more at the, you're a professional, you're here to do a job. If you don't do the job, you will get fined in the same way. If I don't show up to a show day, I don't get paid, right? And eventually my contract gets like cut. Uh, some teams will be more of the, okay, what can we, how do we provide support for you? I think obviously I err on that side. Um, but I think from a professional standpoint, like the league should enact fines on this sort of behavior and obviously i understand it is incredibly frustrating to be a high level player and have people come into your games and troll you like that i have it happen on my stream right like i'm i'm only masters and i have people who will know that i'm streaming and they'll be in my game and they're like sorry mate i'm just not going to go for any neutral objectives this game i'm not going to come ooh. when you ping i'm not going to do this right and i get that but at some point you have to say fuck that dude i am not going to stoop to their level and intentionally lose this game even if you're being trolled that's your responsibility as a professional in the space i remember when i joined the lec on fanatic um there would be i don't remember what it was called it was like you know you would have to show up with with all teams and have conversations with riot and there were like different meetings and briefs on different topics um throughout like many hours during a day it was like a yearly thing um and <laughs> there was one thing at this yearly event called well we called it the toxic player meeting where all the, <laughs> the bad boys that misbehaved in solo queue would be pulled in and pulled in and and, and threatened by <laughs> by people at the lec and told to behave if they wanted to, to keep their spots and i also remember um i mean i wasn't part of those meetings uh thankfully but sure I, I, I remember being. <laughs> what was that supposed to be? Apart from the year when you punched. Like, how would you know about the meme? It was it was a meme because it was always the same players, like every year that would have to attend those meetings, so they were being being memed on. But, um, what I wanted to say was, I remember we were we were told at some point, like in in when we were sitting, like everybody at at this conference and kind of thing that because somebody asked the question to, to one of the, the top riders at, at the LEC at the time like why are people allowed to be toxic why are why are people being unprofessional why do we allow this behavior from players in solo queue and the guy responded that you know if only we knew how many people in the league would be banned from professional play if they st if they made the rules <laughs> more strict and even worse for the national leagues but but that's yeah. that's just a problem with league right now, right? Like even looking at more casual play, like when when I was in high school, we were like a big group of of at least ten guys that would would all play league consistently after school. I'm like the only one. Well, there's like we're we're like two free guys that actually still play. Everybody else quits not because they don't like the game, but because the game is so unbelievably toxic. Mm. And, and and that's just a problem at its core, right? And and I think it's something that at some point in the future should be looked into on the pro player side, so they behave and set better examples and actually act like professionals, but just as much uh, for like high low games and lower low games and anything in between. Well, I think everybody in the League of Legends community is going to hear that and be like, yes, I am reformed. Uh, no, I mean, like, honestly, like, you look at the streamers that have made a really big name for themselves, like, the L9 group, I I just came, like, I started playing League towards the tail end of that or when that was no longer a thing, but I do remember being told, like, there are streamers out there who have an int list, and these are the people that everybody goes and watches and enjoys, and it's entertainment, and for them, it's all fun and games, but for a lot of the impressionable audience, especially younger or people who are newer to League, it's like, 
Well, shit, this guy took my cannon. I'm gonna run it down. Did I ever do that? No. Would I do it? Sometimes? Yeah, well, okay, don't look at me like that. You know, it, it, it happens, but I think like toxicity is like a whole different like can of worms when we're looking at League of Legends. Thank fuck for now it doesn't have a voice chat because I don't even want to know <laughs> the amount of things that are going to be spewing out of people's mouths. But I want to kind of bring back the conversation more in terms of like the LCS and what we were looking well, or the LEC as well in terms of what we're looking forward to next week because as we already touched upon, the LCS playoffs are going to be done. We have uh, two games that we're going to be looking forward to. What is when we're looking at the LEC? We had the draw show yesterday. Everybody is now going to enter these BO3 series. So we have a mega week, actually. Super week, mega week, whatever it's called. It's mega because it's four days. Mega four week because we have yeah. four days. So is there... Match of the week so far has always been the LCS because the LCS is ahead of us and like their matches have like so much of a higher stake. So I would say match of the week would probably be the finals for the LCS. <laughs> yeah, but we're kind of fucked, right? There's no way we can be. C9 TL for MSI for me is pretty exciting too. You know, okay, so one of the LCS playing. games. I'm yeah. sorry, you don't think C9 versus TL is uh, is lesser than Fnatic versus Giant X? Oh, that's gonna I, be know, a that's a pretty big banger. banger. I mean, if only K Corp made it, you know, you could get the name brand. Oh, but unfortunately, yeah. you know, let's you know. Uh, let's let's unpack that. How does that make you feel? Because we're we're looking at Carmen Core here, and it's it's a team that has been tenth again, and it's sad because you look at the fans who are showing up week in week out, chance flags uh buses full of them waiting outside for the people to actually for the players to actually enter the studio they are sitting through the entire day because every single one of their games is at fucking 8 p.m so they're just sitting there at the rye games arena waiting for their players to get onto the stage and then i mean last week they had a win that, that was you know but unfortunately again you know no playoffs I definitely think it's, it's a rough time to be any person related to Common Corp, no matter if you're, you know, the owner or a player or a fan or whatever it may be, because this by far is the most hyped team that's come into the, the LCS or LEC for, you know, almost as long as, as I can remember, really. And it's just a complete disaster. And for me, it's even more disappointing after seeing how they performed in week one of spring. Like just a couple of weeks ago, they actually came in with so much decisiveness and aggression. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking on the desk about how, how much hope I thought there was for them because they all played so well around bow and it looked really good. But then <laughs> once again, it just completely and utterly fell, fell apart from, from that point on. And I, I think when a team is performing this poorly, you kind of have to consider making changes. Well, you, you don't only have to consider, you have to, to change something. Kamets already came out um, on his stream, I think it was, and that said they, they do plan on making some sort of changes going into the, the summer split, which I'm sure is what the, the fans want to hear because I think at this point it's it's hard to pinpoint just one player, one problem. There's, a, there's just too, too many. It's like this meme with the dog standing in, or sitting inside the burning building saying this is fine. This is like. Fine. It, it, it's really really not fine at this point and and i think at the end of the day there's just so few things working and it feels like nobody's able to really shine and, and, and play that way it's like everybody's just being 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 str strangled by by their inability to to work together so some changes are required i i think for me from an outside point of view it's it's really hard to pinpoint what exactly what i can say is that i think i think Bo can be an incredible jungler because he's really really good mechanically and really aggressive but it feels like nobody's really gonna be able to play a similar style and and, and back that up like cabochard has never been known for being like a super dominant aggressive early laner and neither has Seik and neither has Upset or, or, or Takemas. And I think you, you just need to figure out, it. again, it goes back to the intensity, like what kind of team do you want to be? Do you want to uh, build the team around Bo and play the super aggressive 
uh, Chinese kind of style where you just go ham and just destroy people in, in the early game and you build your leads off of that? Um, or, or do you want to take an entirely entirely different approach and go 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 another way? But you just need to show um, some form of, of identity and, and commitment to each other because right now it's just a complete train wreck. So I want to run this by you guys. Uh, unironically, I think a really good move that K-Corp could at least try and do, I don't know if this person would be like appealing, but at least like when I look at the game, I feel like it would fit well. Go get Irrelevant. This guy's really good. And I, I actually feel like it would give Bo a lane to play towards, and you would make space for upset later on in the game. And for me, like this just makes sense. I feel like it just, like fits the team identity much better. I mean, I think Irrelevant is an upgrade, but I also think like you actually could find more of an identity than like, all right, Bo goes ham, and we're going to try our best to support it. And, like, for me, that, like, really looks like K-Corp has nothing going on. Like, this is a team with zero identity. And that's really sad after two splits with, like, the same group. Well, the, uh, the, the problem with Irrelevant is that... I mean, he's, they certainly won't be able to get him now, because there's no yeah. way SK are going to let him go. Like, he's, he's for sure no. one of the best top laners in, in Europe. So it's yes. like, if you are to make changes now... How exactly do you do you approach that? They already tried to make a coaching uh, change by firing uh, Yamato Cannon from from Windows of Spring. That had zero impact. Okay, what next? I guess it's 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 one of your players. Well, who's available? Um, on on the top of my mind, I can think of Apidage as a candidate uh, for mid lane. Mm -hmm. But then you're gonna get uh, let go of Seikin, who's like one of the the key K core players um, for for years, which is a risky move to make would be like the equivalent of a fanatic kicking reckless or whatever. Uh, maybe you could consider something like Kaiser or a Mercer for support. Maybe you could bring in, bring in a different jungler to battle um, a potential language barrier or, or find somebody who can play a different style that may fit more with, with the rest of the team. I don't really know. Uh, it, it's hard to say what the exact move is, and, and that's kind of the scary part. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think uh, the irrelevant issue is, yeah, as, as Boxer said, he's on SK and Carmine Core. I'm pretty sure uh, Kometa has talked about it being a big investment to get into the league and them not having a huge amount of money. So buying out team uh, to players from teams is always going to be a bit of a struggle. Um, I do think it is time to let loyalties to players from uh, Emir Masters days fall by the wayside a little bit. I think you've given Saken his chance. I think you've given Kabushad his chance. I think you've given Targamus his chance. I think Upset is very debatable. Like he's a very good AD carry Upset, but he has been bottom of the league, I think ninth or 10th for the last four splits, five splits. Four. Um, so the, que the question there is like, maybe you think you can revitalize Upset with, a, with like better subs, but the other issue is you're in the middle of the season so who are you going to find you're looking at the free agent list uh, kaiser is the first name that pops into my head i think targamus has had a diabolically bad split whether that's miscommunication with Bo or whether that's him just really struggling to actually be on the same page as the rest of the team um i would probably look to kaiser and i would start looking at how do i step away from what made carmine core in the erls because that it's not as an lec level you know what I think could be an absolute banger? Bringing in leader. Leader mid with yeah. bow. Like Someone explosive, this, right? Th this guy is really explosive. He's also insane mechanically. He's like, you know, really good in assassins and carries. And if you go for him, I can see a style. I know what the style is going to be. You're just going to have full Giga Chat mid jungle gameplay, true progression that's either going to win or lose you the game. But then at least I know what's coming. And that explosive style is either gonna get you to 10th again, which who cares, it doesn't make a difference, or it could take you to the point where you can actually start competing with, with the top teams. But I think some of those bigger risks you're gonna have to consider because right now they've tried to go for like a relatively safe lineup coming into the year. I think making a coaching change and no player change from Windows to Spring is also like kind of kind of safe, but you can't do that anymore. You're just gonna gamble at this point. Uh, the other argument I've seen is bring up Synchrov. I don't think that fixes this team's issues. I think uh, like that, that was a very good ERL level team with Synchroff as part of the Carmine Core roster last year. I don't think it gets you to the level you need to be to compete in the LEC. Synchroff, like he was in LEC 
two years ago? I'm trying to remember who he played for. I remember him being on a blue jersey. Well, I think he's been he was, playing he was with a couple BDS. of different LEC teams. Yeah. Anyway, he was with oh he was with that really the BDS roster that crashed and burnt that went like ninth and tenth as well, and maybe again maybe that's not his fault but it was definitely a, a big struggle for them. He was also with Origin. Origin is the team I'm remembering back in 2017. Um, but yeah, I think that's you have the to really cursed Origin though. Yeah, the yeah. super cursed Origin. Yeah, um, I, I think you have to rebuild from the ground up. Um, I also I would be very tempted to get Yamato back, um, just because I think he is very good at working with young players. And I think you need to, you're introducing a, a roster that needs synergy rather than needs mechanical brilliance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I would trust Yamato to build a camaraderie within a team. And if you can get all the players on the same page, it then becomes a lot easier to have them working in the same direction. Because right now, no one on the team looks like they're working in the same direction. I, also, I, I am friends with Yamato, so I'm probably slightly biased there. I'll just put that out there because... Oh yeah, you don't yes, want to get roasted you know. again in the comments section. Like, oh, I'm probably oh, going to be roasted guy. in the comments anyway. I probably said, you know, Bjergsen's better than Faker at some point. You left a more lasting legacy upon his region. I, uh, that was that was quick shot in the good old I, I, I chuckled at that just because that would be so funny if K Corp like had to bring back Yamato like for being the solution. Like, oh, that would just be Chef's kiss in terms I mean, I of. I think like, the split proved he wasn't the problem. No, yeah, like, he yeah, wasn't. He, I, he I, may have been yeah. part of the problem, but they definitely I, haven't got to the, the core of the issue. I never thought he was part of the problem. I thought he was part of the solution of anything. Yeah. So I, I I don't know if that move was great. I don't know. I find it funny that an org like one of the biggest orgs in LEC, it's just Two tenths with like no hope, and it's it's very interesting because mm -hmm. there really isn't much hope right now. Like that's the yeah. that's the wild thing. I, I will like say it's happened before. Like BDS had a very similar trajectory. They joined the league, they were shit, and then they got to finals the next but, year. So I, mm -hmm. like Carmine Court aren't done and dusted, but things no. need to change. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. they also weren't K Corp, where you do have all the bosses yeah. waiting for people to come out out, which is for, very interesting. Yeah. But it's also like it's not like interesting you bring that up again because it's not just Carmine Core, it's also Rogue. Like Rogue has also been ninth back to back, and it, and if we're talking about like Carmine Core and how they're not gelling together as players, when you're look when I'm looking at Rogue, it generally feels like I'm watching a cameraman POV. Like especially that game that they had earlier this week against Giant X and they were on the Drake. They were on it. And then Giant X approaches the Drake and they go, Oh, sorry, yours for free. Take it. It's okay. And how do you fix that because that's also a very concerning spot to be in ninth back to back but i guess again there's no frenzy of fans that are just sending all these messages like go like yourself in game i, I actually yourself or? Uh, yeah i mean i think upset should have in that last one if he fought on the top side of the fight you know that could have been good but he he <laughs> sprinted back to base you know might have helped I think from a player point of view, it doesn't really matter so much if you play for an organization that has an endless amount of fans or an organization that has, that has like one fan when it comes to performing poorly. Because at the end of the day, in, in the player's mind, they're playing for their career, especially mm. when they're losing. Mm. Like they know that if they don't perform right now, they might be entirely out of a job in, in just a month. And that's the situation for any player or coach that's right now in Carmen Corp or Rogue. Like that's just zero zero safety. It's it's so volatile for for a good reason, and it's it's all based on your your most recent games, and I I think um, your point about you know how Rogue have been so willing to just give up everything without a fight, also goes to show that it, it feels like they're just maybe without even knowing it like kind of mentally checked out. They they don't have trust in each other to go for place. They don't know. Um, that teammates well enough to, to know exactly what they think in given moments and to set up fights together and the, the, the team spirit and willingness to put up a fight and just go at it is, is just simply not there and it's kind of a similar situation as Common Corp where you're going to have to like completely restructure and rebuild that team if you want to have a chance of, of getting back this year uh, because at some point with the way uh, things are looking you're going to have to explode that roster and start from scratch, whether you like it or not. And now, after spring, most likely will be the best opportunity to do so because there's such a long time till the summer split begins, and you can even do like extended tryouts and whatnot to find out what actually works and how you can get get things back on track. I 
I like how you bring up that they were kind of in a way playing for their jobs. Like it something that even Blipo talked about last night on Hotline League, like with C9. I mean, even like that team, if they don't make MSI, given the pedigree of that team and like what it costs to probably field that roster, like he's like, I think they're gonna win because they were playing for their jobs. Like they will step up. Like that is a very legitimate point. Then I, I feel like the pressure like these guys have, I mean, that is a team that always has the microscope on you, like whether you like it or not, right? Uh, and if you're failing like that, that is a lot of pressure to handle. And um, I mean, the each split, you know, they weren't able to handle it well enough to at least make playoffs. So, yeah. Well, it can go both ways. It can lead to them playing a lot better, yeah. but it can also create a yeah. rogue situation where you're so afraid of making mistakes and being the one who looks bad from the outside and potentially being benched. So then you just do nothing the entire game because you don't ever want to make any potential mistake, right? Um, but but I think. Uh, like when you have your back against the wall to, to this point you just you just have to go ham and yolo it <laughs> like that's there's just no way around it and and i think it's a shame they didn't like if 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 the situation is already doomed just go for aggressive picks play confidence show what you really got and and i know that's easier said than done but that's something that that i hope we're going to see from these two teams going into the spring split because if they are to lose and go out at least i want to see them putting up of a fight and just diving in and making plays together because at least then you can say that they really really tried it can be hard to break out of that mindset right like rogue has been a consistently slow team for the last three years like even when they were winning championships it was we'll get an advantage in the laning phase and then we'll wait 20 minutes and then we'll win the game right so it can be very hard to switch your mentality entirely i think rogue actually they gave me a, a tiniest tiniest little light of hope in their game against SK on the final day because they looked proactive. They were doing stuff. They were winning the game. They were making proactive plays and then their tiebreak against SK obviously yeah, <laughs> didn't sad. go too well. So the, the players are good enough. Sometimes it can just be a confidence issue but yeah. moving on from that, I am like quite interested in how the, the LEC playoffs is going to go because we've got some banger matchups there, haven't we, Jenny? Yeah, I mean, I'm really looking forward to Fnatic GX. I really? love a 40 minute VO3. <laughs> I'm joking. You really think Giant X are going to destroy them that quickly? Wow. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For, for sure, for free. No. Um, I think uh, SK Vitality is a really interesting one. Like, from my perspective, SK, the fact that they had to get through, uh, through a tiebreaker. Uh, what's what, what's going on there? Like what happened? It feels feels like what we've seen last year from them in 2023, where winter goes great, spring just like, and then this year they were like, oh no, it's not gonna happen, and then it 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 happens again, and it's just like what's something's not clicking there, something is not going well, and they realistically don't really have that much time to fix it because again, like playoffs start Saturday. Make sure that you tune in for that. Uh, MDK is also a really interesting one. But I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I would put that ahead of like SK Vitality. I think SK Vitality is like, I'm looking forward to see whether or not SK can step up here against a team like Vitality, who has actually scaled a lot into spring. I, I mean, the interesting thing about the bracket for me is that it's pretty likely you're going to have Fnatic G2 in the lower bracket early. Like you don't get the, the winner's finals, you know, best of five to see who makes the, you know, takes the shortcut to finals, but like, you're going to have Fnatic or G2 playing a do-or-die best of three. And I, I think, A, that's interesting. But also, for me, I think that Heretics got a really good draw on this side of the bracket. Like, I think they match up really well to BDS. You have Wonder just to neutralize Adam. That sounds like a winning formula to me. And then Vitality SK, like, you either get Wonder to do a similar job against Irrelevant, or, like, Vitality has been throwing a lot of curveballs, but I feel like Heretics is, like, one of the teams that can be better equipped to do, uh, to do that. I'm, I'm wondering, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I really like, I think Heretic's actually set up to, like, maybe have a best of five against Fnatic or G2. Yeah, I can see that. I have, yeah. I just looked back at Winter because I was like, when was the, you know, the last Fnatic G2 game? I've realized our playoff bracket is identical to Winter apart from MDK and Giant X switching. At the start of the bracket. <laughs> Rigged. Uh, the the rest leaked. of it is entirely <laughs> identical. That's yeah, so last, yeah, last true. split. Uh, I'm just going to give you my predictions for the rest of the split if you guys want it. Um, that's G2 hilarious. will win 2 0 against MDK. Giant X. Uh, sorry, Fnatic will win 2 0 against Giant X, right? Mm -hmm. uh, BDS 2 0 Heretics. Vitality 2 0 SK. 
Then G2 Ooh. will beat Fnatic 2-1. BDS will beat Vitality 2-0. G2 will 3-0 BDS, make it to the finals. <laughs> MDK will make the lower bracket run. And then they'll go into the finals as well. And that's, it's exactly the same script. Beautiful. Uh, I know Lord. we like, I know some of the riders are gone. So uh, maybe we should <laughs> just like, let me use it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's crazy to realize that I, I, I was looking at both brackets earlier today. And <laughs> it's just identical. Man. I didn't even <laughs> notice. That's so random. Literally, I, I MDK do. and Giant X Switch, that's it. But is MDK I, really going to make the lower bracket run this time Oh, around? God, no. But I'm saying it because yeah. if it happens, I sound like Nostradamus now. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I do think uh, the window split showed that it is impossible to predict exactly how playoffs is going to pan out because nobody expected MDK to make it to the final against <laughs> G2. Like, there's no way. But they just, they beat, like every single team they beat four teams in the lower bracket even so to get to the final against against g2 while looking uh, i i want to say decent in, in in regular season but not particularly impressive right but they just improved so quickly and and the same thing could easily happen here i'm really curious to see if teams like vitality and heretics can actually uh, i'm gonna say finally bring some consistency to best of fives and the ability to, to adapt and grow over a series because that's not something I feel like we've really uh, seen from them in, in the past. They just look so inconsistent. Mm. Uh, but but I could easily see any of those teams making a, a run if they actually start uh, gelling and, and finding their, their footing uh, when it comes to adapting in, in a series. I also think while G2 is going to be the clear favorite versus Mad Lions Koi, I think... Matt does have a decent win con in, in, in the bot lane. Like, I think Ooh. both Super and Alvaro are, like, really, really solid players that have, have proven proven themselves in the past. Alvaro was even my uh, num number one support when I we had to do, um, like, the rankings for, for for the winter split. I, I think it was, like, I think he, he was absolutely amazing in that split. And MDK haven't been as great, in, in in spring during regular season uh so they've they've gone under the radar a little bit but i think they do have clear win conditions and i mean mervin still is playing really random top laners which makes uh <laughs> him a threat and generally they're not that easy to draft against so i think uh that that team we're still gonna keep our eyes on yeah you're bringing up their bot lane particularly i want to touch upon super i think yeah, unless you've been under a rock there has been an interview where he mentioned that he is the best ad carry in the league and there is two camps the internet is absolutely divided as the internet usually is where people are like oh what a fucking piece of shit why would he say that and then there's the internet that's like yeah he's right and asking him about it more in depth he went through that well i have to believe that i'm the best ad carry it is the confidence that i'm bringing with myself i was in the finals of winter as someone who worked so hard to get where i am so therefore i am the best AD carry. Now, I think that's a confidence that any player needs, especially when they're coming into the LEC or into like these higher leagues. But also, to what extent could that be misinterpreted as just cockiness and sheer delulu? I mean, I'm always down for players to believe in themselves, right? Uh, but like, you know, as the person that's probably watched the least amount of tape on LEC, I like got all of you, right? Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's. Like, the best AD in the league is probably Hans, Flacket, or Noah. So, like, I think Soup is fine, but I just think flacket has been really good this split from what I've seen. I I've been really happy with his play. And, I don't know, I, I'm i fine with, like, believing, but also, like, you do have to, like, understand, like, where you stand. And sometimes where you stand is not always as the best. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I think that's, like, the only place I differ with Supa. Like, yeah, you do have to go on the rift and believe like you can beat anyone. I think that's key to being successful in anything competitive. But they, they're also like, if you're really good at your craft and you review, you review your craft, you should be able to properly assess like where your competition is. And I think that's where Super stands within his competition. Fair. I, I think generally it's pretty hard to pinpoint one person that's the best AD carry in, in Europe right now. I mean, if you ask any of the top five AD carriers or top five players in any role, I'm sure they're going to tell you they're the best in the league because 
that is what you you have to to, to believe yourself and then tell yourself in order to perform at the highest level i think it is a bit of a shame that super didn't come with any actual legitimate reasonings as to why he might be the best that he carry uh, i think his argument argumentation for what you just said is, is a little bit thin and and underwhelming but i think uh, the biggest weakness that that i have seen uh from from him and it, it's not even entirely his fault it's just math have been so inconsistent but um i think certain other ad carries have have had better better and more dominant um early games uh, like when it comes to that i think someone like ice i would have a bit more faith in uh but but i think like he's doing a really really good job uh later in 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 mid and late game when it comes to positioning and team fighting for for the most part and i think the top eighty carry spot in europe is is really close right now i think when it came to the window split it was really difficult for me to pinpoint who was the best AD carry in the league because I didn't actually feel like any of them were impressive. I ended up voting for Hansama as the best AD and that's a Hansama that looked pretty bad compared to the level that he showcased last year. But I compared him to, to Ice and Super and Noah and Flaggett, etc. It, it's it's like, it, it just felt like like the best and most, most natural option. And I think once one of these guys actually start showcasing a super high level of consistency repeatedly like a really good laning phase um really good positioning in fights consistently having that really great read on like how to utilize zones to always set themselves up for success and, and just dish out the most amount of damage without dying like then then i'll start being impressed but man i, I think all of them have moments where i'm like losing my mind <laughs> trying to find out like what they're actually doing and you know how they 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 dare to die in these ways in, in professional games that it, it's all really messy yeah i think the big thing for just going back to the super quote is i have no problem with you saying i think i'm the best player uh, i'm the best at my role i think that's that's confidence right Mm-hmm. When it goes into arrogance, is saying, "Yeah, I'm better at every single aspect than every other player in the league." Right? That that's that's the bit where I'm like, "Are you like, if you could show me how you're better than all of these guys?" As Boxer said, "Sure," but um, coming in as a rookie and, and being that, I will I'll say arrogant. I think is that's probably why people are more upset with him or think it's a little bit you know too cocky. If he ends up proving it, sure, great. Yeah. But right now, I think. I could ask 15 different analysts and they'd tell me five different players who were the best at micro in the LEC as an AD carry and the best at team fights. So uh, being that confident in yourself sometimes can, can come off across as arrogance, even if you need that confidence to play well. Well, they made it to the playoffs, so he's going to have uh, a chance Just. to prove himself, right? Like he, he's ha- he has a chance. He also has summer yep. to prove himself. But I think like, again, confidence is key, especially when it comes to playing against all the caliber of players in the LEC. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to see how that plays out. We have another question. Uh, unrelated to this topic, but still a question from one of the viewers. And again, leave any comments down below for us to answer next episode. It's from HuganStefan1729. And is uh, the question of, is sexism in gaming as bad as it seems on Twitter? I can answer this both yes and no. Because like on Twitter, it's bad. Like it's bad. I don't know what the fuck y'all are drinking like what's in your water what's on your keyboards like is there something that just like happens to your brain when you open that specific application not just twitter though like instagram as well people going out of their ways to send dm requests to women that work in esports where it's like oh it's because you're a woman oh it's because you look attractive thank you but what Uh, it's just like yes it on twitter it is very bad but when you look at it from like a professional perspective so you look at it from the people that i work with or i look at it from uh well obviously people i work with from talent from production from people behind the scenes from uh, security everyone is very kind and very welcoming and very open to the fact that you're welcome to be there like no one is sitting here and like gatekeep some of you guys in the comments are sitting here and gatekeeping stuff that's also crazy but it's more like people are very welcoming and it's very nice to work with the people that i work with i personally have never experienced an instance of like oh where i made being made felt uncomfortable because of my gender but i want to also say the fact that i have only been in esports for two years so my pool of experience and my pool of the people that i have worked with is very small and it's a very and women in general in esports are becoming it's becoming more of a of a, of a 
driving force or more of like a priority on the agenda. So no, it's not as bad as it is on Twitter. Absolutely not. I think my male colleagues have been very uplifting, very kind, great with feedback, great with making sure that I'm being considered for opportunities. On Twitter, just close your eyes. That's all I can say. Just, yeah, the stuff that people say on Twitter. Uh, yeah. But uh, great question. Yeah. yeah. Well put, Jenny. Thanks. I appreciate it. So I, I'm lucky, I guess, in that regards. Um, and then our last question that we have, unless one of you wants to chime in. Um, I don't think it's our space to talk about your experiences. Ah, that, see, <laughs> see, this supportive colleagues. That's what I'm talking about. That's I've been very lucky in that regards. Um, I studied finance. I worked in tech. And I would say it was worse with my colleagues and my um, fellow students when I was doing those topics than it is mm. working with people in esports. Um, so that's, I guess, something to keep in mind. Debased Alex asked, holy shit, the jungle is back. Yes. And we're going to be back again next week. So make sure I you like, like and subscribe. subscribe. I, saw, I <laughs> knew you were going to say that. I was like, that is. I had to like get it in. But thank you guys so much. Uh, any closing statements that you think would really capture the audience from either one of you? New like TFT set is a banger. Please stop picking Bard. I want to play Bard. <laughs> Off topic. All right. But- I've been watching Shogun, and that show rocks. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go watch the next episode tonight. Oh, let's go. I'm going to get okay. a t- ton of food, because I can't eat tomorrow, because I'm having wisdom teeth surgery. Yeah. So, ton of watch. food, watch Shogun, pop pop as well. Very important oh, yeah. to pop pop, pop when very, you can. Very, important. Yeah. Ooh. Have, you, right. not, have you never pop pop, Cubby? I, don't, I actually don't know what you're referring to with pop pop. Oh, oh, baby. Wow. Okay. That, that's I, I get into one of the best words to do before the next episode. Oh, oh no. Can you okay. ask Nick and Jay for the rights for one episode, Broxa? And we just have it as the backing music for the entire uh, episode. I may, may have. So maybe we, I yeah, should get them to come to them. do like a little private uh, concert just for copy mm. so he finally gets the experience, you know? Ooh. Yeah. All right. A little okay. private concert. Uh, I guess Cubby's looking forward to next week. I hope you guys are as well because we're going to be back. As I mentioned, take care of yourselves and we'll see you then.